Sin makes us beastly. The story surrounding Psalm 51. And third, being restored. So first, we've been talking about the beasts that surround us. We've been looking at the Michelangelo painting of Saint, the torment of St. Anthony, and how it's a great description of the spiritual life, a temptation that's around, clawing, scratching, pulling. And as Christians, we've been stressing the fact that baptized Christians with Christ in us, the power of Christ, that we can have the look, as Deacon Tim mentioned last week, and mentioned that we can lean into the light, we can act, confess our sins, repent from our sins, and we can show the beast who's boss. They don't stop swarming, but we can show them who's boss by killing sin and vice in our life and, and, and being on the road to becoming a virtuous man, virtuous woman, becoming holy. That's the point of the Christian life. But if that doesn't happen, Right? If those things aren't pursued, like striving for virtue and killing sin and vice in our lives, if Christ isn't pursued, it's possible that we become the beasts. Now hear that poetically in a way, right? Because as humans, we can't become demons. To be human is to be made in the image and likeness of God. But make no mistake, Sin makes you beastly, and you begin to resemble the beast. We know this. We know, we know this. We know this from children's stories. I mentioned it was a month or two ago. I used the illustration of the child story of Beauty and the Beast, and the, how the beast, the prince, right? He had that stuff going on. He was a he was just not a not a good man, and the sin that's in him ultimately showed, and and he became a beast. I mentioned I'm reading through the Chronicles of Narnia, the children's stories of, by C.S. Lewis. And, you know, there's, there's a boy in one of the books of the uh, Voyage of the Don Treader. The boy's name is Eustace. And Eustace is just a nasty boy. And he just continued to be nasty. And his nastiness grew. And ultimately, what happened to Eustace is that he became a dragon. See, it would be really nice if... if Sin makes us beastly and becoming beasts, it would be really nice if that was just a children's story, if that kind of thing only happened in children's stories. But we know it to be true in life. Sin makes us beastly. Which brings us, secondly, to the story surrounding Psalm 51. We heard the psalm, we hear the psalm every weekend at Mass, the cantor sings and it's after the first reading and, be, and before the second reading. And the psalm today that we hear is Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is known as the sinner's psalm. To really grasp what's going on in Psalm 51, you have to know the story behind it. Because King David is the one who's writing the psalm. He wrote the psalm and he's writing it right after a series of things that just took place. Things that he did. And David, being the king... He's responsible to, his responsibility is leading the army in battle. So as the army's out there in battle, at one point, he doesn't go out in battle. He's lazy and he stays back at home. And while he's back at home, one night he was walking on top of the roof and he looked over across the way and he saw a woman out there bathing. So he was overcome with lust. He said, I've got to have her. Because he's the king, he sent for her. She came and he committed adultery. It just so happened that the woman that he had an affair with, Bathsheba, she just happened to be the wife of King David's top military generals, Uriah. Uriah, who was out battling in war, fighting for King David. And so some time goes by, and Bathsheba sends word back to King David and says, I'm pregnant. So David finds out Bathsheba's pregnant. He does everything he can to cover up his tracks and a number of things. The first thing he did, he called Uriah. He's like, well, let me get Uriah back here. Hey, Uriah, you need a break from war, from battle. Come on back. And he pampers him a little bit and he says, spend the night with Bathsheba. Spend the night with your wife. You've earned it. 
And Uriah being an upright man that he is, he says, I can't, I can't do that. I can't go in there and have a nice night when my men are out there battling. I'll sleep outside on the grass. And that's what he did. And so David's plan didn't work. And David continued to plan and connive and try a number of different things. Everything he tried ultimately failed. And so he had Uriah killed. He sent a note to one of the, the soldiers and said, hey, go to the fiercest part of the battle. And when you get to the fier fiercest part of the battle, tell, Ur tell Uriah to go and to lead that pack. And as soon as they attack, I want everybody else to pull back. So David committed adultery and he's also murdered somebody so that he could then have Bathsheba to be his wife. It's worth pointing out here just for a moment to pause and pointing out the obvious. David wrecked his life. We looked at a couple weeks ago when we were talking about this over the tips of overcoming temptation. We looked at the fact that five minutes of sin can wreck a life. That's what happened with David. And we know that we know that to be true. Like we see it standing in lines at in at the grocery store, and you see tabloids, right? You, you see it in the news that five minutes of sin can wreck a life. I see it all the time. This is what happened with David. David wrecked his life. And the ripple effects upon that we see. David wrecked his life, yet, and yet he still triumphs. He triumphs. It's not, it's not to say everything that he did like was just undone and say, hey, that, that doesn't matter. No, but David did get restored. He was ultimately confronted with his sin and he cries out in Psalm 51, which is a psalm we hear today with this prayer of repentance, the sinner's psalm, which we'll get to in a moment, but we need to stop and pause and really realize, can you see? Can you see how sin makes you beastly? Can you see how that happened with David? that not only that, but he unleashed beasts all around him, all over the place. And you might say, yeah, well, I see it in David, right? I, I can see it in David, of, of course, but like, I've never done anything like that. I've never, I've never killed anybody. I've never done, I've, I've never had an affair, maybe. I've never done anything as bad as what, he's, th th what he did. See, you're missing the point. Because David was a man, the, the scriptures say, he was a man after God's own heart. David was like the poster child. David was handpicked by God. Like you don't get better heart, you don't get better than David. He had, he, 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 was, he was beloved, he was handpicked. His heart was for God. See, if David has that stuff in his heart in order for him to do, that he's capable of that. You don't think you are? I don't think I am? That's what, that's sin. See, but David doesn't become beastly. You and I don't become beastly like the snap of the finger. That's not what happened with David. I was listening a few months ago now with two psychologists. One was Christ, one's Christian, one's secular, but it doesn't matter because what they're saying is true and it's what they're saying is an indication about the spiritual life and what the scriptures point to. And what they said, one of the psychologists studied the horrors of the 20th century with, with what happened in Germany, with, with, with Nazism and the, the Auschwitz prison camps. And the other guy, the other psychologist has spent his life studying rapists, serial killers. And both of them, studying both of those things, they said from a psychological level, you don't become an Auschwitz prison guard overnight but rather it's a series of 10,000 micro violations of one's conscience that ultimately gets them to the point of doing the things that, that, that an Auschwitz prison camp guard is capable of doing. It's a series of 10,000 micro violations of one's conscience that stacks up, that leads to ultimately one becoming, resembling a beast and becoming a beast. If sin goes unrepentant, it will make you into a beast. You need to be restored and you can be restored. We can be restored. Which brings us lastly here to being restored. David, David blew it. You'd be hard pressed to find anybody in, the, in, in all of scriptures who blew it worse than David. And David didn't repent at first. And the scriptures really, you, you could see that it's it, nine months go by before David repents. He tried to cover up things. 
You know, sure, he probably thought to himself, man, I messed up. I messed up. That was in, that was an in, inappropriate relationship. I know it was, but it's time to move on. But I got to put that to the side because I'm the king. I've got a nation to run. There's more important things that need my time and attention. So let's just, it's time to move on and to forget about that and to move on. Sin doesn't just go away. It's not like pressing the delete history button on a computer. Sin and guilt do not go away by simply saying, oh, well, I don't want to think about that anymore. Oh, well, that's in the past now. It's, it doesn't work that way. Ultimately, David was confronted with his sin after nine months. It eventually happened, which is a great little insight to say the beast always comes out. The smell of it, the carcass of it, it'll ultimately get out and it will be known one way or another. And it happened with David. And he ultimately turned to the one, the only one that could do for him what he couldn't do for himself, no matter how hard he tried. And he makes the cry in Psalm 51, in which we heard, have mercy, have mer the cry, have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense, thoroughly wash me from my guilt. I've tried to wipe it all away on my own. I've tried to push it away. I've tried to forget it. I've tried to do a number of things to cover things up. I, I, I've tried to get rid of the guilt. Anything I tried didn't work. And in verse three, he cries and says, for I know my wrongdoings and my sin is constantly before me. See, if we're gonna really repent, we need to have the same spot as David and to have our sin always before us. I need to own it. I need to say, I did it. I messed up. I claim it. I, and I'm sorry for it. My sin is before me. So you see, then I can do something with it. I can give it to the one who can do something with it. And he says, create for me a clean heart, O God. And the word create there in the Hebrew is bara. And bara is only used one other time in the entire New Old Testament. And it's in Genesis chapter one, where God said he created the heavens and the earth. God bara the heavens and the earth. So David knows that what he needs, to, what needs to happen for his heart, he can't do. The only one that can do for his heart what needs to happen, him getting a clean heart, needs to come by the one who created the heavens and the earth. You can give me a new heart. Create in me a clean heart. The illustration for this, I mentioned Eustace, which is the boy, the nasty boy who turned into a dragon. Eustace tried in the book, he tried everything he could to shed the scales of the dragon's skin. And as he would peel back and pluck off the scales, as he plucked off a layer, another layer would just come grow back. And the dragon would, the boy Eustace as a dragon would shed tears and he would cry. Until he finally let Aslan, who's the lion, who's the Christ figure in the series, he finally let Aslan close enough because at first he was afraid of Aslan. And the text says this, Aslan says to the dragon, you will, have, you will have to let me undress you now. And the, the dragon says, I was afraid of his claws. I can tell you I was afraid of his claws, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it, that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I'd ever felt before. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. It hurt so bad, but it hurt so good. The movie, which usually does the books an injustice, the movie has, does it in a cool way where Aslan's there with the dragon laying on the beach in the sand, and dragon, or Aslan, the lion, walks up maybe 20 feet from him, 
And Aslan just takes his claw in the sand and just makes one swipe in the, in the sand. As he makes the swipe, the dragon transforms back into the boy. Eustace, just like David, just like every one of us, we need to be cleansed from sin. And some of us, some of us here, we've acted beastly and we feel beastly. And for some of us here, that keeps us from going to him. We feel like that we've been disqualified. That is a lie from hell because the father looks upon you and me and every one of us and he says, I, I can't stop loving you. I know your deeper secrets, I know the shadows and I can't stop loving you. David wasn't disqualified and you're not disqualified from what he offers. I'm not disqualified what he, from what he offers. If we sincerely repent the way David did, he will not deny us. Last Wednesday, we heard nine hours of confessions here in the church. This Wednesday, it'll be myself along with another priest again. Don't go around with unrepentant sin. Don't go around with sin that's unaddressed that you just try to say, oh, let me, I'm gonna do away with this. I'm gonna look over here. I get a, I, I'm a busy guy. I gotta get on with things. I gotta, let, let me, don't go around with unrepentant sin. Don't try to pretend it away. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to take care of it yourself. Unrepentant sin distorts. It makes us beastly. Lay flat down on your back and let him go deep simply allowing him to simply scratch his paw so as to be restored.